Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Voodoo Room, Ronnie Farella. So, so your your all your uh, curriculum is done online. At the moment, everything is online now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Normally, I wouldn't have any teaching now, but I'm just through Melbourne Uni. I've been running this winter intensive. It's like it's, um, it's an elective. It's called uh, free play. So it's like this 12, 12 two hour lessons or sessions on um, free play, improvised music, sound, sound art, that kind of thing. And normally, you do that over a semester, over your twelve weeks, but we're doing it in a month. So you do three three sessions a week. And I'm doing a bunch of them, so it's quite a lot of teaching mm. online. Mm. But it's fun. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing a bit of research myself. It's the first time I've really run it. Yeah. Um, just now I was looking at some John Cage and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, um, and look at some of the music concrete, yes, yes. you know, from the 40s. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, Sound- stuff's beautiful. I don't know a great deal about that stuff, so it's, kind of, it's been fun. Sounds familiar. I, yeah. I, did, I did an arts degree in, in sound art. Right, at RMIT right. and Phil Samartsis. I don't know if you have heard of Phil Samartsis. I know of Phil, yeah. yeah. He was one of my lecturers yeah. and he's right into that um, field, you know. Yeah, I mean, he, his apparatus when he was out doing field recording was quite amazing. He was like a, um, he was like Harry Butler in the wild, but with audio equipment. Right, yeah. You know, um, yeah. And he had a, uh, I remember he took us out just in in the courtyards of the uh, Melbourne, the old Melbourne jail, and he had a, a Japanese, uh, you know, what the Japanese flute players. What, the, what do they call those? Uh, sh- sh- Shakahara- shaka, shaka, shaka 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 Yeah, I'm not pronouncing. Yeah, yeah. I'm not pronouncing it correctly. That's yeah. okay, but I think people would know what yeah. we're talking about. So he had that person in in some bushes playing this beautiful meditative sound. And then he had this uh, acoustic guitar player about 20, right. 20 metres away from him playing, just doodling with his acoustic guitar. And he had this microphone as part of his apparatus um, that was omnidirectional, but it was very sensitive and it could pick up long-distance sounds really clearly. And um, it was a French company that made this particular device and i had never seen him they had just come out and he was he bought it and i think it cost him a lot of bread i think it was like 15 grand or something like that just for the device you know and when i when he played it back to us i was amazed at the at the nat how natural the like recording out that was when i first realized recording outside because you've got no walls yeah no reflections so the sound behaves differently, and if you can minimise the outside sound from that, but i.e. cars, birds chirp, yep. chirping, yep. whatever, or you might add the birds that chirp, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, he could. He really made some really interesting sounds with that, and um, right. maybe that's something for your cohorts at Melbourne Uni that they might yeah. want to do Look, something. They, you know, that's, I, I suppose, a more, not extreme version, but a different thing is there's one thing we're looking at. There's a guy, um, Francisco Lopez, who made this work just through a recording of the, through the Amazon uh, rainforest. And he sort of edited it a little bit, but he didn't mess with it too much. And it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Mm. The sound's it's so beautifully recorded. Yeah. And it is so rich. And his whole thing is to hear it like a piece of music, uh, but not to look for similes or representations of what we think of music, just to hear it as, you know, to let it be music. Yeah. And it's really fantastic just to listen. But like you're saying, just to hear things presented differently. Mm. It's refreshing. It's lovely. It is, and if you're yeah, and uh, it can really. I, I just thought you can be really indulgent with that sort of thing, and um, yeah, and, and and I just didn't have the time or money to have that indulgence, unfortunately, because um, I remember going out to the uh, refineries in North Altona uh, with my little uh, Eddie Roll, which I thought at the time was you know, pretty, pretty good, this little MP3 yeah. uh, recorder, you know. And I had, and I had one of those Sony stereo mics, the little one, the pencil ones. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and I just, because I, I grew up around the refineries and I remember the industrial sounds that you used to hear 
um, of the ref- the the, uh, the chimneys making sounds when they're releasing the toxic uh, gases and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And with tr- and with the uh, Geelong Express going by, and um, and then you've got birds chirping, and then you've got um, this sort of uh, because it's close to the bay, so you, you can actually you can almost smell the bay from where from where you are. You got yeah. so you got this mixture of yeah. refinery smell. You got the bay, and you got uh, in you know these light industrial um, uh, how uh, commercial um, businesses that run their uh, businesses in that area as well. So um, I, I, with this Eddie roll, I, I just recorded a whole lot of ambient noise. But by the end of it, after three and a half, four, I think it was about four hours just sitting and walking around, just recording different sounds, uh, I really ended up using um, – only a po- maybe five minutes worth of that in a in a in a conceptual sound piece that I put together. Yeah, yeah. So it can be quite link. Uh, quite a, it can be a lengthy process. That's what I'm. Trying. It can be. A com- yeah. Well, yeah, it can be a real rabbit hole thing yeah. as well. Yeah. And for me, who's you know you know me well enough, I, I'm really coming from a hands-on. Uh, you know, I'm a tradie. Yeah. You know, I play the drums. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, that stuff's immediate. You get on, you play. You, you, you know, even if you're on your own, the, it, it's sort of not as – the options aren't so limitless. Mm. The imagination is always, you know, can take you anywhere. But you, once you're on that kit, that's the kit. That's you it. Know? That's what you're so, um, with. You, the great thing, though, is jumping into this more conceptual way of listening really is fantastic when you get on the instrument. You know, I've, I've – um, I mean, I'm sure we'll get to talk about this. It's been interesting what I've been through this pandemic thing, what I've been wanting to listen to, you know, kind of sim- much simpler music generally. I've been listening to a lot of country music or um, folk, you know, uh, Mississippi John Hurt, you know, mm-hmm. that guitarist, yeah. folk country guitar stuff. But just yesterday I was, I was listening to some Morton Feldman composer, okay. some gorgeous, very minimal piano music. Um, and just reading some of the liner notes, and the whole thing is about the decay. You just get these two or three notes, and they'd be played, and then there'd be like enough time for that whole sound to just do its thing. And then I went later up that day. I went and played some drums, and I thought, "That's cool. <laughs> it's cool just to hit the thing and then just let it, yeah, let it speak. Let it take as long as it takes to speak. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Just that one hit can uh, represent." A whole range of um, sound connotations, you know. Yeah, and it can travel, and it can, and, travel. It can and it can connect. Yeah. You know, often it's that the gap mm. or the trail, the trail of the the initial sound or utterance that is really interesting. Mm. You know, and it's yeah, it's always connected. Yeah, so it is. It is. It's fantastic. So uh, yeah, just the sound thing. Can really, uh, yeah, and I suppose because I'm doing lots of Zoom, I'm doing lots of this. Yeah. Everything is so close to my to my head. <laughs> it's, it's nice. It was really nice to sit in my lounge room and my speakers are quite far away from each other, yeah. and just hear some space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm living in headphones at the moment. You know, um, doing the Zoom. If I'm working at work now, I've, that's what I'm mixing with because I'm mixing for the stream or. Yeah. Um, if yeah. I'm talking to someone on the phone, I'm using my Bluetooth headphones. So it's like this. Uh, it's interesting how headphones have now become part of the apparatus to your brain. You know. Well, the um, yeah. What what what's the um, you know? We sort of uh, what what's what's the word? Cyborg. It's part of our cyborg. cyborg yeah. Um, you know. Uh, yeah. Arsenal. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's. It, <laughs> You know, we've we've got all our information. That's it. And now it's coming directly through. Yeah, that's we're, it. we're hooking in. That's we're it. hooking in. That's it. Yeah. Bit worrying, but um, yeah. Talking about what you've been listening to. You, to be honest with you, I've been going back to uh, records that I grew up with in right. in the late seventies, um, and uh, some some of the things that I've re-listened to that I thought was fantastic back then. I thought. No, that that wasn't great at all. You can hear how 
how bad that actually is. Um, but then you have the odd one where you go, this guy actually was an incredible artist. And, uh, and one particular artist was Jerry Rafferty, who, who right. wrote Baker Street. And um, yeah. um, that album, City to City, I don't know if you've heard it before, but... Uh, I reckon I, I know Baker, of yeah. course, uh, well, not of course, but I know Baker Street. I don't know if I know that record very oh, well. It's a, it's a, it, every, yeah. it's every song is a is it's a, a an amazing it's an amazing piece of art. The whole album, it's really well written, right. Really well composed. It's it's um, it's informative in terms of where he was um, in his life. Um, it's a real self reflection sort of. Th- uh, album, um, but yeah, just and I and, and and I can just listen to that on repeat daily. I know that might sound weird for people listening out there, but I, I can wake up in the morning, put the headphones on while I'm making a coffee or whatever, and I can just listen to it and and it really just embraces you. You know, it, it really can yeah. make you just drift off and. And you've got all these incredible harmonies on in some of the songs, and uh, really well, you know, it's a really well crafted album. Um, yeah, I get that. I, I see. Sorry, I see that as music as companionship. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like music um, satisfies so many uh, needs. It does. <laughs> you know, and that, but that's yeah. So I've been, I've had. Two, I've had this Mississippi John Hurt thing on repeat, which I just go to every now and then, you know, for years. I just, I know the songs, sing along. Um, but also this Chris Christopherson record, The Austin Sessions. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff. Yeah. The cut, like his early, um, and I didn't know much about, I mean, I grew up on those hits. Yeah. But I watched that SBS um, country, series on country music, mm-hmm. and he was sort of all the way through it. And then my friend Frank Desario, you know yeah. Frank, Frank said, check out that record. Mm. And Frank, whenever Frank says, check out a record, I check it out because he's, he's on the money, yeah. almost always. Yeah. Um, and it's great. And the songwriting is just so good. Oh, he's, an, the, he, the, he's an incredible songwriter. The, lyric is, yeah. the lyrics are just fantastic. Yeah. They're so clever. Yes. Clever without – not just clever without being um, showy clever. Yes. Just cleverly – they really get in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, but, but yeah, that Jerry Rafferty thing. Yeah. So, what year is that? That's 70, late seventy-eight. 70s. Seventy-eight. Seventy-eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he was in another band before that, which was called Steelers Will. Do you remember them at all? They had that. I did know the name. Yeah. I know the name. Yeah, yeah. that same with me. I didn't really. T- I, the only reason I know about it is because I watched the documentary on him. Because um, he, uh, to cut a long story short, he he came from that famous band still as well who had I'm stuck in the middle with you that song that's that's right and, yeah um, so he wrote that and then he had a hiatus for a number of years because he was signed to the to a record label and uh, he didn't want to work for the record labels anymore and so he had th- three years and they had to produce x amount of records within that period of time so they just sent him rubbish basically you know yeah just fulfilled the contract just to fulfill the contract and, yeah. and then in the interim, he was working on this album, City to City, which he funded himself and then got a record deal. Uh, I'm not sure who the record company was that uh, took it up, but, um, yeah, he had to really uh, haggle for his uh, – for the. Co- but the irony is, I mean, it was num- – it never got to number one, but it was a number two hit for seven weeks at number two on the US Billboard. Right. So a massive album, really. Yeah, he must have really come apart with the initial um, studio record label. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I think that do you hear those stories a lot? The, I don't know if you know those famous Miles Davis cooking, working, yes, relaxing, right. yes. steaming. Yeah, that's one of those stories. That's right. That's right. Because he did he, he did to, a similar sort of thing. Yeah, I think he had yeah. to finish. He owed them four records, yeah. and he made those in two days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, right, there's your records. Yeah, I'm out. That's right. Where's my money? That's right. Oh well, they're good records, though. Oh they're, yeah, still you know, great. You know, terrific. Band sounded good. Yeah. yeah. But that that was the thing about those days, you know, which we um, 
don't see too much of it these days. You know, it's record deals like that. You know, the money's just yeah, not there. I think, you know, for record companies no, to do that. You know, yeah. Um, well, I suppose the money is there, but the money comes like in so much business now. The money comes from one big record. You know, as opposed to perhaps forty OK records, and then you know, thirty really not very good, and then a hundred really shitty ones. But we get by, you know. Yeah. It's just everything is about making that one big record. Yeah. Where all the money comes from, but yeah, and it's the relationships. Yeah. That that's I I feel like that's uh, we've talked about this before. Yeah. You know, that's the big thing that seems to have collapsed a bit just throughout. I think throughout a lot of the music thing all the different roles that people had, you know, um, down to your club owners and your, your, your kind of enthusiasts who would put the odd gig on, you know, that just doesn't seem to be as, as fertile, as rich. Yeah. Yeah. And the money is part of it. Yeah. And I think, I just think the way we, you know, the, the kind of critic, what am I trying, the media is sort of being become fairly, um, sidelined by by the social media like facebook and you know that those there's not as much music criticism maybe maybe there's more but there's not as much mainstream music criticism you don't really get reasonable reviews in the age or in any of those papers anymore no you know you don't get reviews you, you might get someone writing about someone who released a record but that's not a review yeah. that, that's an ad, that's an ad that's an ad yeah you know that's an ad. It's not a review. Yeah, yeah. No, the landscape's definitely changed, and that—that's that was my point. Really, is that um, uh, in the in the height of the uh, late seventies, early eighties, where there was, I'm talking specifically record labels. Uh, I'm not talking uh, uh, in terms of pub or club or or um, concert no. hall gigs or anything like that. I'm just talking specifically how they. Um, position themselves especially in, in america as a business you know business model i mean the manager of kiss just to give you an example um in 1974 he look, he was their manager from 1974 to 1981 and he uh uh got them the record deal to sign with casablanca which was a disco label right so they had kiss on this disco label because they, they, right. they had Donna Summer and a whole bunch of stuff right on Casablanca, the label get Casablanca. So uh, the guy who owned Casablanca was an ex-Warner uh, employee um, yep. and decided to leave Warner. And But the, but the Casablanca was a Excuse subsidiary me. of Warner Music. And uh, anyway, when Kiss um, started to break, after two or three years, they had they were very successful – and um, they went to access their royalties, but there was no royalties because Warners were, were taking their royalties to fund to funnel their uh, record company. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, so that when they went okay. to ta- so they had to go to court and do all this sort of stuff to get their money, you know. And then they yeah, and right. They, so yeah, it was it was it's an interesting uh, story um, about how. Anyway, this manager, which I this is what surprised me about it, was when he was trying to kick them off and getting getting them signed and uh, touring them initially and doing all the PA work for them because they were a, a PA machine, you know, public PR sure. PR PR public yep. relations machine. PR machine, yeah. yeah. They um, he 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 put up his um, he, well, the guy who owned Casablanca mortgaged his house to to fund it to fund their tours the manager uh put everything on his credit card so in one week he racked up twenty four thousand dollars back in 19 God. back in 1976 or whatever it was right yeah so you can yeah. you can only imagine and he and the bank's ringing him up are, are you going to be able to pay this bill and then thankfully for them when they finished the tour they made so much money that they were able to repay all their debts and the guy sa- they saved the guy's house and so on and so forth yep. and they become a ma- major success for the next 6 years you know and was that with like the, the big hits were the early hits 
were the early songs, weren't they? Like I Was Made For Loving You and well, – or were they later? No, yeah, they were later. Um, I Was Made right. For Loving You was uh, 79 and that was on the Dynasty album, which oddly enough flopped in, Am- uh, off, it flopped in America, believe it or not. It didn't sell as much. But it was more popular right. outside of America, like Australia, New Zealand, England, whatever. Massive, massive outside of that. But in America, it didn't even get into the top 20. Yeah, right. Big, that's, a, that's the first big concert I went to was Sea Kiss yeah. in 1980, yeah, I think. Yeah, where was that? Yeah. In where? Yeah. Uh, football Park in Adelaide. Oh, they came to Adelaide at Football Park. They came yeah. to Adelaide, came to Adelaide. Yeah, they, everyone came. That was good. They were, well, like, from 80, all through the 80s, I saw I saw so many concerts. Yeah. Like, big concerts, yeah. It was great. At foot- Bob, I saw Bob Dylan Football Park. Football Park, is, is great. that's not the Adelaide Oval, is it? That's the other one. Uh, that's the other in one. In West like, Lakes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that that's where they were. There was a couple of different places. But I think that's where that was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many yeah, how, how many the, people would have but big puppets. How many people would have been at that concert? I think they were like 40 or 40 or 50,000. Yeah. Look, uh, but I can't quite remember. I'd have to be yeah. you know, uh, have to check that. But I think they were really big. Yeah. yeah. I mean uh, their staging equipment was massive for its time, you know. Like, yeah. like they apparently yeah. they, were, they had up to fifty semi trailers or something, you know. So, yeah. so they were definitely gr- groundbreaking in terms of touring and how you would tour on that big scale, um, which was making them broke as well. Oddly enough, that's another story. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting. My point is, is that uh, the manager who. Uh, uh, basically put all that together. He was a very intelligent guy in terms of the way he market, marketed uh, Kiss and actually putting Kiss on a disco label. That was that was a genius, Mark, because a rock and roll band on a disco yeah. label, you know. That is, look, I, years later, even that song I was made for loving you, it's what made me think of it. Years later, you know, I'd listen to that. Go, oh my god, it's like disco. When I was a kid, I thought it was heavy rock. It's like it's kind of like disco. That, you know, it had, does have all the tropes. That's right. And they had to yeah. do a disco song for Casablanca, and that's the song. Oh, really? Yeah. That that it, it's a roller skating. It's song. a roller skating rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what yeah. I mean. Like that's the sort of perfect kind of roller skating sort of speed. Yeah, yeah or that kind of eighties yeah. disco. To Melbourne in 1980, and they did Waverley Park, which was the equivalent to Football Park, I think. I never went because um, I was too young. I was only 11 or something when that when they came out. <clears throat> right. Uh, but I was a huge fan. Um, yep. But do you realise that Football Park is no longer? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So. Um yeah, that's why I was a bit confused. It was it was Football Park, the one that's no longer. Yeah, I know they've got this kind of huge monolith Adelaide Oval, which is well, you know Adelaide, the, the big celebration. Adelaide, I, which is the cricket ground. Yeah, but that's a beautiful ground. Like that's a, a beautiful a, ground. Yeah, it is. Yeah, as a sporting ground, it absolutely is beautiful. I remember uh, yeah. driving when I used to live in Adelaide. I lived in Adelaide briefly in the mid nineties uh, in Glenelg, and I remember going somewhere and I saw the ground for the first time and just the from out from the outside I just thought that is actually a beautiful looking ground you know yeah yeah they do um I've never been there for a cricket match but they do say it's one of the great cricket ovals oh, okay yeah like say it's, it's very beautiful yeah not just to play on just to as a spectator yeah, yeah. right what would be I think because um uh, Adelaide was a uh, state that uh I don't think it had convicts. It had free settlers from England. So, Correct. So, so, That's right. So it has that real English feel about it. That's what I noticed when I went there. Even the accent, you know, the, it's almost like a slang slant on their cousins from the UK, you know. Absolutely. Like, um, well, I'm sort of lo- I've sort of lost a lot of it. Michelle's still hanging on much more. Plant, dance. I'll still say plant. I can't say plant. That's a, and my daughter's... Totally Victorian. Yeah, she has she has such a nah, that sound. Yeah. yeah, no Adelaide, you can really hear it. I can tell if people are from Adelaide, the accent is quite different. Yes, yeah, I can. Yeah. I can too. Um, 
yeah, like I said, I, I lived there for six months or so in, in Glenelg and uh, in the mid nineties, and um, yeah, I remember that distinctive, distinctive, uh, and I was all, and I always was curious why was that, and then I researched it a bit, and I realised that um, it was the free settlers that went to Adelaide, and um, so that even the roads were different because um, they were much more wider, like the actual. And the way that the grid was yeah. set up, the grid was set up really well in the uh, yeah. CBD it, uh, of Adelaide. Light, Philip Light, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah, it was a very well planned planned city. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Um, really easy to yeah. get around. Yeah. Really easy to nav- really easy. navigate if you're going east or west or north or south, you know. That's right. So um, you can learn a lot from Adelaide. I, I mean, yeah, I still very. I mean, I grew up there. I'm still very fond. My last big concert I saw before the the big lockdown was I was in Adelaide in on March. When was it? March the thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth. Is that when it was? I was in Adelaide. Yeah. That's when they announced the big. You know, that's when the phone calls came in, and the gigs were cancelled. You know, um, but I was in Adelaide um, for because the, the festival was on. Mm. And so I went, there was an opera they were, they were showing, um, Breaking the Waves, a relatively new opera. Um, from, do you know that movie, Breaking the Waves, yes. Lars von Trier? Yes, I do. From whenever that was, late 90s? Yeah. yeah, wonderful, like amazing. And so I was, leaving, I was leaving Melbourne, it was raining, I was rushing, grab, grabbed a cab, I was thinking, oh, fuck, I might miss my train, plane, got there in time. Planes delayed, and I'm thinking maybe it's not even going to happen. Finally, get there, see the concert, amazing. And my wife Michelle was there doing a doing a concert, um, a Steve Reich thing. So the next day we had a ticket tickets for the Symphony Adelaide Symphony Orchestra doing Mahler's Eight. I thought that'd be fun. That gets cancelled because someone from the orchestra came down with COVID. So the very last concert of the last concert I saw was this, because um, the festival was on, we thought we'd see something, it was a two, two-person two play, sort of like punk theatre, you know, put on by these young young kids. Um, and really it was just bemoaning the kind of capitalist society we're living in. So I thought it was really interesting. That's a lot. Instead of seeing Marla's Eighth by the, you know, the ASO, I saw this sort of punk, punk-esque theatre, you know, talking about, perhaps the end of capitalism and lo and behold <laughs> the next day it all kind of stopped i just thought it was just an interesting so let, kind of uh, so, chance so the, was that the end of the adelaide festival on the 13th of march it was actually yeah well actually well that was the friday they were at, they called i don't know if you remember they called the kind of lockdown really for the monday Right. So yeah, that that Sunday, which would have been the fifteenth, was the very last day. Oh, well, they scraped. Yeah, so they, they were lucky. In. They got away with they it. They scraped in. Yeah, they scraped in. Yeah. Wow. That and it was it was just interesting. Just that weekend, it was weird. It was you could just feel that everyone was getting a bit weirded out, going, "What's going on? What's going to happen?" Um, and anyhow, it was just one of those. Um, it will be. It's one of those. I remember where I was moments. You know, I mean, not that it's like a well, it's a marker, an event like it's a marker in, of time. It's, gonna, it's a marker. Yeah. That's right. It's the beginning of this kind of new new era. Yeah, because um, because um, yeah, I watched a documentary about that Adelaide Festival, uh, the last one of this year, and how uh, the uh, directors. It was based on the directors of the festival and their trials and tribulations of getting performances and trying to sign up performances uh, for the festival. Which is a right. which is a year long process for them, you know. Yeah. They, they're constantly doing traveling, which will, with Corona now, uh, that would hugely impact on the, uh, next year's festival for sure. You know. Yeah. If it will, yeah. if it will go ahead at all. I was in Italy. I did a festival in Umbria, the Umbria Jazz yeah. Festival, many years ago, and I went to a concert in one of these old theaters. Um, and you, yeah, you're absolutely right. You felt so part of the whole thing and it was running really late and it was really hot. It was summer and it was like crazy hot. And, um, and I, this is such a fun experience and there's mostly Italians there being in Italy and they start having a whinge 
that it's running so late about the management. And there's this wonderful conversation just happening, s scattered through the whole, you know, ground uh, uh, ground floor there. And it's like it's like you're in a lounge room. Mm. You're amongst yeah. it, you know. It's like family squabbling. Exactly. People are so close yeah. and felt so comfortable talking to each other about these bloody, you know, organisers can't get it together. It's too hot and we're running late. Mm. But, yeah, it's because it's so close. Yeah. And once the music started, you felt so, yeah, so engaged. Yes. And I do think, like, Hey Mahal doesn't have that feeling. It's, um, it's, more like a, it's more like the Coliseum. It's more like a gladiator event. It is, yeah. You're quite far away from it. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, it's quite distant. Yes, you it's are. quite otherworldly. Yeah, it is. Um, you're watching something else. Yeah, which which is interesting uh, for me because I've worked there and I've worked overseas in some theatres and I can see the difference. I can feel the difference, um, and that's what I guess I'm trying to express. That uh, it's not having a dig at anybody at all. It's just the reality of our history, and our history is. A very the, the arts and what I'm saying is the arts is a very young culture in in in, in Melbourne, yeah. Australia, really. You know, um, when it, it hasn't been looked upon as a historical uh, cultural part of the essence of Australian culture. You know, through pri yeah. through primary school, going through to secondary school, no matter what part of Melbourne or Victoria you're from. You know, there's selected schools that will undertake. Uh, those cultural elements that will lead kids into um, some of those uh, cultural pathways into university yeah. and things, but for the most of it, it's it's that throwaway culture, you know. That's right. At, at, at best, it's a luxury. Yeah. It's something to it's something to you know have fun with or experience. It's a nice thing to do, yeah. as opposed to an essential thing to do. But I think you're right. It's because we're a young country and we haven't had. Um, episodes or you know times when all you've had is your culture mm. is your is your song is a song maybe that keeps the kind of people together mm. during wartime and stuff you know mm. I'm, i remember doing a gig um at, at a pub um with, with michelle was singing and she's singing the song um i'll be seeing you you know that yeah oh it's a wartime song and it's a song they used to sing when the boats would take off to go off with the soldiers to off to war, I, meaning I probably won't be seeing yeah. you, you know. And there was a woman in the crowd who'd come to this gig regularly, Sylvia, who's 90 years old, wow. who was singing along. And I was just thinking, damn, she was there. Yeah. This, this got real all of a sudden. This song got really, really real. Yeah. And it was wonderful. And I, I, I got, you know, quite choked up. Yeah. And I thought, this song means a lot more all of a sudden. That, I suppose that's that thing. Not We're not old enough to have those experiences through through the people. Yeah. So art becomes this other thing. That's right. This essential. Yeah. But small rooms, you know, if you if you experience it in a small space, you have more chance, I think, of getting that um uh, that shot that shot from the dark, you know, mm. or that bolt of energy you go, Oh shit. Yeah. Something happened. I want more of that. Mm. Yeah. I think we're on the same page with that yeah, one. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, Ronnie, it's been great well, talking with you. Yeah. Take care. Hey, thanks for the rave, Pete. Thank you. I appreciate it and thank you for your time. Okay. See, see you, buddy. Bye-bye. You must have cast a spell.